Hey everybody, this is our second lecture on um, hermeneutics and exegesis, and I'm just so glad that you are willing to watch and be a part of this today. Um, this YouTube is available also on our Facebook page, and so um, hopefully you're going to be able to participate through all of the series of lectures that we're going to do, which I think is about 12 uh, series of lectures. Um, and once again, uh, the laws of hermeneutics and exegesis really is just describing uh, the approach to study the Bible on your own and understand exactly what the Bible is saying in terms of the message that is found within the text itself. And so I want to help you walk through that. I gave you some general rules last time. And um, we're going to make sure that those general rules really do stand up to scripture and what the word of God actually says. In other words, we set out rules, 10 rules, but can we prove those rules from the word of God rather than just trying to prove these rules from academia or prove the rules through some philosophical idea? Um, we just want to know that, you know, this message that God gave to us, he gave to us in language that we can understand from Genesis to Revelation. You know, people make Revelation an impossible book to understand. It's not true. Then it's not the Revelation. It's it's not the unveiling. It's the secret. And it's not the book of secrets. It's the book of Revelation. And so we're going to have to really back away from um, tradition and, and uh, ideas of men and just start saying, wait a minute, you know, I, I need to take a new approach. We need to get out of our bias that we try to impose upon Scripture, which then obscures its actual meaning. And I'm going to say that again. We get out of the bias, our own preconceived ideas that obscure the actual meaning of Scripture, and just approach the Word of God in a, as a conversation with the Lord. And you say conversation is more like, you know, one way. Uh, message, uh, just a monologue. Well, it's not because every question that you ask, the Word of God has an answer for it. People want to try to just, you know, approach the Bible as though, you know, it's an obscure message for people in an obscure time. It's not. It is God revealing His Word and His, uh, revealing His will and His desire for man from the very beginning. And although there was things that were said and done by Adam and Eve in the context of the Garden of Eden, its meaning and its impact still has an effect on us today and has a message to our everyday choices. And certainly God's judgments haven't changed because he's eternal. And so the judgment he had, for example, uh, with Adam and with Eve or Chava, if you're uh, from the Hebrew tradition, it's the same judgments that he has for us today. God is unchanging. He uh, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His judgments aren't going to evolve. They are established. So what God said concerning, you know, um, the world and the nature of things uh, during the time of, of, of Enoch and the times of Noah, nothing's changed. So what he said to, in the context of, you know, the days of Nimrod or, or Abraham, nothing's changed. His, his judgments are the same. Sure, it's a different time, it's a different culture, and maybe, yes, understanding certain things about the culture and about the times would help us to more fully appreciate more value in what's being said. Nothing about that first, you know, you know, encounter, if you would, with that which God described to Abraham, for example, is going to change. It just takes on more meaning. And, of course, the same holds true, whether it's the days of Moses or Joshua or the judges or David or Solomon or during the period of the kings and the judgment upon God, the judgment of God upon the northern kingdom or, or the situations that existed in the days of Judah or Josiah or Hilkiah or Jeremiah or the days of Ezra or Nehemiah, um, nothing's changed. And, you know, in terms of how God feels and what he's purposed and the expression of his laws of life. And so we want to take every word of God personally. Jesus made it very clear. He says, behold, I come in the volume of the book. It's all written of me. It's all about me. And so, you know, it's all about God's love and his mercy and his goodness to redeem man from the sin and the iniquity that took a man prisoner and so we really want to build scripture upon scripture we don't want to superimpose for example i watch people all the time take and impose things on genesis chapter 3 or genesis chapter 4 or 5 or 6 
that shouldn't be there. It's all doctrinal biased, and that doctrinal bias or that preconceived idea is really going to obscure the meaning of Scripture if we're going to impose some ideas that we already have. Let's let the Word of God talk for itself, speak for itself. And like I said last time, what we're going to do is I'm going to take you, after we get finished looking at the general rules and understanding them, I'm going to take you through... Um, applying the hermeneutics, the rules of hermeneutics and exegesis to one passage of script, one passage of scripture that's found in Acts chapter eight, verses fifteen through sixteen, and we're going to ask a lot of questions of the scripture, and we're going to look at a whole lot of doctrines that are being revealed in that passage of scripture that are very important doctrines to the church, and we're going to discover that we are able to go with especially now it's so much easier those of us who are just back from the day of strong's uh, concordance and you know a few other desk references and commentaries recognize how much easier it is to work through the bible now that we have these all these computer tools uh, that comes with uh, logos or uh, so many other um, you know biblical programs and you want to use it because you know, we're going to let the Bible define the meaning of words, and I t talked about that, and and we're going to understand, you know, how to really get at the value of words, and, and then I'm going to help you understand a little bit more, because obviously the sentence is based upon the, the words that are used, and the meaning of the sentence, the meaning of the paragraph, and is based upon the sentences, and the meaning of, you know, the chapter is based upon the paragraphs, and the meaning of the paragraphs, you know, the meaning of the, of the, uh, uh, of the book is represented, you know, by the the paragraphs and the meaning of the paragraphs and the chapters, and you know, and so on, and the whole of the Bible. And so, that's why there has to be, as I was saying, an ongoing commitment to Bible study because we grow and mature. All of us are growing and maturing, maturing in the knowledge of the Lord. And so, you know, giving ourselves continually to the Bible study, we get to continually see more clearly the big picture of things. And, you know, uh, it's, it's far deeper and far more enriching than just, you know, studying uh, history in class or, you know, if, if you come from a, a clinical background like I do, you know, studying chemistry and biology and the sciences and, you know, et cetera, it's far more, it's, it's much deeper, it's, more, it's much broader than all of that and, you know, um, there are many books that some of us have studied. We never want to study them again. We studied them once. We pretty much got it, you know. And then, of course, what happens is, <laughs> with each discovery and with each passing year, those things change and they're updated. And now, what we learned back in, you know, in biochemistry in 1985 is really not even relevant anymore, or whatever, you know. Or some of it's relevant, but a lot of it's changed. But with the Word of God, it's unchanging and it's so much more enriching and it's so much deeper. And it's a spiritual activity, and, and those and people want to come along, and they want to make it purely natural. Look, you can't do that. Jesus said, "My word is spirit, and it's life." His word is living, and it's powerful. It's living, and it's powerful. And you know, we, once again, as I said last time, it's so important for us to make sure that we're all playing, as it were or operating under the same rule or at least under the same consecration and commitment to God because there are so many people out there that are making statements that are you know that have gotten THDs or PhDs higher degrees in education that have given them a voice and they don't believe that the Word of God really is all the Word of God they personally have taken approach of dividing the Word of God from what isn't the Word of God and then they're gonna tell us what the once they've got that all straightened out they're going to tell us what the word of god means well i personally don't want to hear anything about that why because they did not approach the word of god with any kind of reverence as it is indeed the word of god and they it, they've taken it as the word of man and so we went I, I want personally nothing to do with that because once again listening to them is going to simply obscure the actual meaning does that mean that we're not going to the examine reference books and commentaries no we are we're going to listen there to everyone as many as we possibly can um however we want to really understand where they're coming from and we want to also be sensitive to the danger of over reliance upon uh, these various different books because of the bias that they want to impose from their own personal perspective of the Word of God, how much it is actually the Word of God, of what they actually even 
view as God and all the other doctrinal biases that they bring to the table when they're trying to tell us that they have really un veiled the meaning of it through, you know, some kind of, you know, clear understanding of the historical settings or some real, you know, insight to the true meaning of the words. Wait a minute. You know, the Lord, let me just remind you of this, and especially in the hermeneutical rules, the Lord has made it very clear that he has revealed these things to the simple, to the babes. You know, he's hidden these things from the wise and the prudent. This is the message of Jesus, and it's been revealed to babes. So the Lord has spoken to us in the simplest human language possible. So it's very important to grab a hold of these rules, lay hold of them, hang on to them, don't let them go for any for any reason. And so, um, yeah, let me go back now through with you in um, the value of the Scripture. I, I think that sometimes what happens is there are people who want to... Um, as it were, make us reliant upon themselves by making somehow uh, the study of the Bible and understanding its meaning um, more difficult than it is. Just remember, these things are given and revealed to the to not the wise and to the prudent, but to babes. Does that mean that somehow we are then um, uh, excused um, or in any way? Um, not part of the the commitment that God has purposed us to have in terms of being students of the word, studying the word, to rightly divide the word of truth? Well, no means. We're not certainly not excused from that. Um, we want to absolutely give ourselves to the study of the word of God. It's just that we want to understand the, the approach here. And as I said, Isaiah 66 uh, verse 1 has really got it, and through 2 has really got to be an important part of our understanding how to approach the Word of God. And so, um, and that is to tremble at His Word. And if you don't tremble at His Word, it, it's not going to be, it's not going to be revealed. And um, and I want to just take this, look at, look at these general rules. Number one, I said, we must let the teacher who is the Holy Spirit guide us. To approach the Word of God without honoring the Holy Spirit who is the teacher well, that is just absolutely unwise. And so, you know, it, what, I, what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to show you uh, the definition, if you would, of defining um, the, the validity of these rules that I put forth. So if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 14, we see uh, concerning all the things that are in the heart and, and mind of the Father, which is being revealed and established to us, and I could more specifically say it's been because it's written in the word, but it's being established because we're learning and we're growing that these things have come to us by the Holy Spirit. OK, so uh, we, we understand that what I hasn't seen, what ear hasn't heard, what's neither entered into the hearts of men. God has now revealed them to us by his spirit because it's this, the Holy Spirit who searches out everything. In, in yes in the deep things of God so he understands the meaning of the words he understands the context better than anybody else you know you history is also going to be constantly viewed through a prism or even as it were a glass um, or the disadvantage of someone else's idea or perception of that historical event so once again you know, secular history, ancient history, you know, biblical history scholars are still looking and viewing history through the lens of human perception. Will that create a bias? Absolutely. Uh, the purest sense of understanding the Word of God then is understanding the Word of God from the Word of God itself and recognizing that God has miraculously and supernaturally provided for us the ability to get right at the meaning of the word, and that is by the Holy Ghost. And so someone's going to take that away or somehow devalue that or somehow say, well, oh my goodness, that's dangerous because now the you know, the word of God is going to be very subjective and not objective, and everybody's going to lose their footing, and we're going to have all these crazy ideas. Look, we've already got a bunch of crazy ideas, and it's obvious that people have lost their footing, you know, uh, and and so that that argument doesn't work. Uh, but if we will acknowledge God and rely upon him, there is a miracle to be had here. And God, the Holy Spirit, is never going to take away or add to the text itself. 
Um, and every every part of the scripture is going to actually be confirmed by scripture. And so we don't have, we've got the balance of the word of God itself describing to us the framework in which the Holy Ghost reveals and makes clear what the word of God says. It's not some hidden mystery, mystical meaning. It's the Holy Spirit brings to us a supernatural guide and aid to be able to fully appreciate exactly what the Bible is saying so that we really truly do rightly divide the Word of God and understand the context and what Father is saying to us personally. Because remember, Paul said, look, these things are written for our admonishment so that we don't fall after the same example of unbelief. So I'm saying to you very clearly that the Bible within itself contains all of the information that we need to know and have available to us to understand the rest of the Bible. We don't need scholars and theologians and we don't need all of these extra additional aids. Are we going to refuse to listen? Not at all. I've spent my life studying commentaries and scholarly reviews and understanding the value of when someone is taking me to the Word of God to explain the Word of God to me versus the, the, the things that I don't value when somebody's trying to take and may obscure the Word of God or use something external to the Word of God to try to help me appreciate or value really what it comes down to, what the Word is not saying. It really, by and large, boisters their own opinion and their own ideas. Well, we want to get away from that. We want to, yes, we, every time we approach the Word of God, we're going to have some kind of concept, idea, preconceived idea, perception, opinion about the Word of God that has been developed in our life. Hopefully those preconceived ideas, those bias, those perceptions have been developed by the reading of the Word of God and not by just preacher preaching, you know, ideology, philosophy, um, and, and the things that come to the table in an everyday Christian experience. Unfortunately, the latter is very much the case. And so we've got to recognize, wait a minute, how am I going to continually be growing and, and, and developing in terms of this bias? Give me some tools to help me get out of my bias. And so what we're going to do is we're going to teach you how to approach word studies, topical studies, where we basically are able to quickly go in there and look at all of the scripture that speaks specifically on that topic, just as I'm using, for example, let the teacher who is the Holy Ghost be our guide, and I'm taking clearly taking you to a context of, a, of the Word of God that is describing to us where the Holy Ghost has come to unveil to us those things which men have not seen or in which they've not heard or which they've not understood. But now the Holy Spirit is causing us to understand this because he's the one who understands it more than anyone else. And he says to us in verse, 13, oh, verse 11, what man knows the things of a man except for the spirit of man which is in him. Um, and so he, he says, even so the things of God no man knows. It's the Spirit of God knows them. And so the Lord is going to give to us a clear understanding of what God says and what God's perspective is and why he approached, said the things he said and required the things that he required and asked the things that he asked. And it's going to then be applied directly to our life so that we don't fall after the same manner of unbelief, so that rather we will respond to God like Abraham responded to God, not like Israel in the wilderness respond to God, so on and so forth. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, this is very important, Important, but the Spirit which is of God, so that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Those things that are freely given to us of God is fundamentally found in the Word of God. The Word of God is the truth. It's the truth that liberates us and sets us free. It's the Holy Spirit that then empowers us to more clearly understand what the Word of God has sent and how it applies to our life. And once again, not making, you know, our life, you know, the Word of God conformed to our life or to our generation or our time, but rather we conform to the Word of God. So we, we speak those things not as, so which things also we speak not in the words which men's wisdom teaches. Come on, and this is a very powerful lesson to us here to start off with, and it needs to be applied to the way that we 
study the Word of God, but we, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So we're going to get an understanding of what to do and what not to do very clearly from the examples that are laid down for us in the Word of God, because really understand this, the Bible is all about redemption. It's a story of redemption. It's a story of dealing with men who dis a man who disobeyed God and walked away from God and God's love and mercy constantly reaching out to redeem man and describe to men very clearly the difference between the choice that man made in walking in the realms of sin and darkness versus the will and purposes of God for our life. And you know and and, and then of course verse 14 really helps to underscore this. The natural man will not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And let me just define this. If the Word of God does not express to us those things that belong to the Spirit of God and those things which are spiritual, then there is nothing in our life that does. So uh, this is clearly referring to us, referring to us those things which God has always wanted men to understand and they refuse to understand it. And so God in his love and his mercy gave us a new heart and he gave us a new spirit as the prophet Ezekiel said in Ezekiel 36, 26. And he put his spirit within us so that we would then walk in more than just walking in his commandments, more than just walking in his statutes, more than just walking in his decrees, which has always been the earnest desire of a father to have this response from those that he entered into covenant relationship with. We're going, we're now privileged to walk in the Holy Spirit, to walk in the Spirit. And as Paul said to the Romans in Romans 8, 3, we do these things by nature now. The things that are contained in the law, we do by nature. And of course, when, you know, many times in the, in the New Testament, when we refer to law, and even in the Old Testament, we're not only just talking about the Torah, but we're talking about, you know, the prophets and the writings as well. Um, and so, you know, we're going to talk more about that as we go along here. And once again, we're going to be applying these rules uh, 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 not only to, uh, you know, establishing that we do have the right general rules, but especially you're going to see them at work more and the way we uh, flesh out the various different doctrines. And what is being said as, as you begin to write in Acts chapter 8, verse 15 through 16, let me encourage you, go ahead and start, you know, doing your... Um, you know, study of Acts 8, 15 through 16 and beginning to understand full, more fully from the context of Scripture what has actually been say, said. And, you know, going to appreciate this more too um, as we move along here. And and, and, and as, as I take you through this study uh, and, and we walk it out together. Now let's quickly go to another verse of Scripture and... Um, you, you'll see in my slide that I have a number here, uh, John 14, 26, Holy Ghost is the teacher. And then John 16, let's just go to John 16 and go ahead and back up to verse 12. And, and the Lord says, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Uh, Batsazo, uh, which is the word that is the Greek word that is used for bear, um, is you don't have to know the word batsazo to begin to appreciate the word bear, you can begin to just develop that and understanding just from the context itself, you know, to receive it, to understand it, to, to embrace it, to have it, you know, fully unveiled to you. There's so many different ways to, to, to understand this verse of scripture just from the context of what we're, of what we're reading in. And I'm not going to go into all of those details right now, but I just want to show you how you can apply these rules, to, you know, as you're, you know, basically bringing credence to um, the rules that we're setting forth. And, you know, it's like you can uh, take those those two words, for example, and you can, uh, of, uh, of the teacher and, um, and, the, and the spirit, and you can begin to do topical studies there. And every word in the Bible that refer, refers to uh, the Holy Spirit being the teacher, being the guide, uh, being the one who is going to be the instructor, will then, you know, be easily brought together and you can begin to understand and appreciate just upon a, as it were, double word search, for example, that goes out there and quickly gathers together uh, uh, all of these various different scriptures, like the ones that I'm referring to right now on a specific topic, and then begins to make clear to us what God is saying. 
uh, concerning the role of the Holy Ghost to be our teacher, to be our leader, to be our guide, to be our instructor, to cause us to understand the things of heaven. And here in this particular context, if there's anybody who can understand context, at this time, it would be the ones that Jesus is speaking to. And because they, they're in the context, okay? Jesus is right there in front of them. He's showing them the ways of the of the new covenant. And he's being for us an example and a model of exactly what God has purpose for us. You know, that's just it. The Lord hasn't just left these words and and these statements that he's made without context. I mean, he's given to us the very context itself, the life of Jesus Christ himself. The four gospels reveal the life of Jesus Christ himself. And sometimes people will basically take some minor, what they view as contradiction or a lack of symmetry, as it were, or, uh, you know, description in the gospels, and they will highlight that when in reality that can be clearly and, and simply explained. And but at the expense of not rather instead highlighting the very person of the life of Christ Jesus, what he lived, what he was, what he did, and, and what is being expressed very clearly about himself, and making that the bigger issue and the point. So we have the context, the new covenant, the whole of the new covenant, the gospels, the book of Acts, you know, the epistles. Come on, listen, that is talking as directly to us about the new birth, this new life, the new covenant, and the context is really understood more clearly when we recognize that even the disciples who stood there in front of Jesus, who had more clear understanding of exactly what he was saying and the culture and everything else, he's saying, look, you can't get this. You can't bear them now. You can't be resist You could say responsible for them. Um, you could say um, understand them. You could say carry them. You could say respond appropriately. Um, you could even say context without the Holy Ghost. He says he says you can't get it right now. But how be it when this when He the Spirit of Truth has come, referring who to the Holy Spirit. He's the Spirit of Truth. He's going to lead us to guide us in all truth. What better clear under what better or clearer understanding could we attain? from the word of God than what the Holy Ghost is going to come and reveal. It is the Holy Spirit who unveils the truth. He, he's the one who revealed Christ Jesus, and he's the one, you know, is the Holy Spirit. From the very beginning, <laughs> he overshadowed a woman called, a young virgin called Mary, and what was conceived on the inside of her was the eternal word of God who was made flesh. And so what we can come to understand and appreciate here is that Christ Jesus is the living word who fully reveals to us the written word. And the written word is all about the living word that would come and do this. Okay, And the Holy Spirit, he's the one who's going to guide us. He's the one who's going to lead us. He's not going to speak of himself. But whatever he hears, uh, that shall he speak, and he will show uh, you things to come. And that was unveiled through the disciples, through uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was unveiled. And somebody said, you know, people want to make a point about Luke. Well, we can argue about Luke. There's a whole lot more about Luke than just stuck, sticking him in a category of being a Greek convert, uh, Paul of Antioch. I mean, come on. There is much reason to believe that he was prior, uh, was prior to that because, come on, he was an eyewitness. He was there from the beginning. And I'm not going to get into the definition of that because there's so much controversy. But neither am I going to be led by someone that doesn't really truly believe that the Word of God is the Word of God. Because we believe that it's the Word of God and it's very accurate and Father's kept it and preserved it. And every word, every jot, every tittle is kept by the power of God. Okay, so, you know, and that's where really, really where a lot of people then our groups are separated out and i'm happy to be separated out on the side of those who believe that the word of god is absolutely the spoken god breathed word of god the divine revelation that came to us and in simple human language that we can understand and um and 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 then from that point move forward i don't want to be convoluted with the people that believe that the word of god only contains the word of god and that then we have to have the genius of men to come sort this out for us i mean okay so uh, i'm going to say that probably at the point of being totally redundant but it's a very important point uh to have so that we can be guarded in our pursuit of really fleshing out the things that God is saying in his word when we go and then reference other commentaries and other supposed experts, and hopefully they are experts, 
you know, and I and I have a lot of value in Lang. I have a lot of value in uh, so many other great uh, scholars. But for me, I I'm a little bit more sensitive to where I feel like that they're breaking away from the Word of God, and now they're just using other means and methods to tell us what God has said in His Word. Look, let's rely upon the Holy Spirit. Let's honor God. You know, there's so many uh, hermeneutical rules. As I said before, there are a lot of varieties on what hermeneutical rules people are going to espouse. But you know what? Uh, unfortunately, many times we see the lack of the hermeneutical rules having an inclusion of first and foremost an honor to what the Holy Spirit is going to do and His role. And you know, there's many different reasons for that, and we're not going to go into that right now. But the bottom line of it is Jesus saying that he shall glorify me. He shall receive of mine. He shall show it unto you. Everything that I have, all things that the Father has, are mine. And what is it that belongs to Jesus that he wants us to have? His life. His life is going to be described to us, explained to us. It's going to be contrasted and compared for us through the Word of God. And it's going to be contrasted and compared to those things that are not the life of God. So that we can very clearly understand the laws of the spirit of life that have made us free from the laws of sin and death. Come on, we don't have to, that's not some kind of mystery. You know, some, we got to go into some kind of, you know, a background and philosophy in order to be able to understand. The Word of God explains that. Give yourself to continual study of the Word of God, as well as continually reading the Word of God and putting an emphasis on continually reading the Word of God and asking the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you. You know, I've heard people out there say, oh, look at the terrible way that we're training folks because we have the daily bread and they draw, a, you know, a scripture from the daily bread and they read it and they apply it to their life and it's not in context and they assume something, something now about that verse of scripture that they don't have the right to assume. Who says so? Because I'm going to tell you right now, God's Word is has a many splendor glorious view of it you know i can put things for example revelation chapter 12 in its context right up basically chronologically because john is a chronologer of scripture everybody should know that if we didn't know that john was a chronologer of scripture we wouldn't know that jesus ministry lasted in any more than just over a year but because he constantly was chronology giving us a chronology based upon the feast, Passover, for example, we know that Jesus' ministry was over three years of, uh, of time. And so, you know, in, in the, you know, of course, Luke gives us the setting also even in, in a more generalized sense by giving us the ruler and the governors, etc. But bottom line, going back to John, we know also that that chrono chronological nature carried over into the book of Revelation. He then highlights that, uh, those things which you've seen, those things which are, and those things which shall come to pass. And then we can see that Revelation chapter 12 brings us approximately to the middle of the tribulation, the seven-year time period in the middle of the 70th week of Daniel's vision. And I know I'm speaking a lot of stuff out there that may be confusing you, but I want to show you how to get at that through the continuous continual reading of the word and the study of the word. So once again, I can place everything in Revelation chapter 12 into a context into the future, but at the same time, it has direct application now because we can see over and over again, as soon as God is about to do something, as soon as he gives an anointing, as soon as he's, you know, raising people up, Satan, like a dragon, stands there with his mouth open through his actions and deeds and through his deception to try to consume the man-child or that which God is bringing forth at the very moment in time that it is born. We see it in so much of the history of the church. We see it so much in the history that is given to us in the Bible. And, you know, Moses is an example. We can just go back to Moses. I mean, it's, it's right there. As soon as his birth, you know, Satan through um, Pharaoh is trying to destroy him. We can see the same thing with Jesus and so many other more subtle situations. And so even though that has a, a, a context, a contextual uh, setting in the future, it has absolutely a living, valuable meaning for us right now that we overcome with the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb and loving on our life even unto the death. has a value and a meaning for us right now, even though the context of it is yet future. And we can say the same thing of the past. And so it's important to appreciate this and not get locked into some rigid application when God's word is really all about redemption and 
and bringing us into a place where we understand what he's willed and purpose for our life and where he's contrast and compared simply obedience and disobedience his life and the life that belongs to the realms of this world and the realms of the prince of the power of the air so I hope you can really appreciate what, what's being said here. So Jesus says a little while and you should, well, forgive me, all things are the Father, and all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore, said I, he shall take of mine and shall reveal it unto you. And there are so many things to say about that. And in the context of first and foremost, what Jesus was saying in his life and what he was declaring there in the longest monologue of Jesus uh, that he gave there at on the last Passover supper that he celebrated with the disciples. Yes, context is valuable. Yes, the audience is valuable. But you can't rigidly lock it into Passover night and a description to at least 11 disciples. It's bigger than that, okay? And so if we can appreciate that and study the Bible enough to realize that that is indeed the truth, then it's important for us to lay that foundation for you. And if somebody is saying otherwise, then it's important for us to be guarded and objective about what else they're going to say, say about the scripture. Every word of God is profitable for instruction. And so, you know, you know, uh, uh, I can't go to every one of these verses of scripture um, one by one. Oh, I'm in San Diego and said that's what all this noise is about. Being back in the city, jets going over, dogs barking, crows crowing. But uh, hopefully my, my voice is still louder than all these other voices. I hope that the word of God is still louder than all of the other voices. Once I've spoken, once everybody else has spoken, let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Let every man be a liar and God be true. God cannot lie. His word has stood the test of time. I mean, his word is not going to be changed. Its application, its meaning, its value for us, whether it was the word that God spoke to Abraham or it's a word that God spoke to uh, us through his son, Christ Jesus, the word is not going to change. If there's any hermeneutical rule that you need to emphasize and get above everything else, it is that God's word is not going to change. And, you know, and so for what you're going to discover with me is that, you know, I got all these subtopic hermeneutical rules to the topical hermeneutical rule. And I, I didn't write all of them out separately. Uh, just because I would never get through them. Listen to how, you know, verbose I am you know, already. So I don't mean to be verbose. Um, obviously, it's just there's so much to say about any word of God. Anything that God says in his word, there's just so much there. And so look with me quickly, Psalms 119 and verse 18. And we hear, open them, Lord, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. And once again, it's God who gives us revelation. He's the one who retains all rights to revelation. You go to Deuteronomy 29. The Lord says, unto this day, I've not given you eyes to see, ears to hear, or hearts to understand. Well, why? You know? What's God saying there in verse 4? What he's describing to us is he's like he's saying, look, once again, look at the context. That's important. Over and over again, the children of Israel refused to obey. God brought great revelation to them. God brought great, you know, um, encounters for them to have with them. But every one, every revelation, every encounter, every instruction was just met by rebellion and betrayal and resistance. If they would have just simply obeyed, with that obedience comes, comes more and more revelation. Somebody says, well, I want you to prove that. Okay, well, we'll do that later. You prove it for yourself. You can discover that this is what God will do. He will come and he will bring the simplest revelation to cause you to realize that you are in your sins and dead in your trespasses and sin, but there is a Redeemer. How does that happen? The preacher preaches, but the Holy Ghost goes and does a work that's far deeper than what is coming out of the preacher's mouth. And that drew you to the moment. That revelation drew you to the moment or to the crossroads of the moment. Are you going to obey? And when you obeyed, God worked a miracle for you. And in that miracle came an even greater revelation of all that you stepped into and all the wonderful things that God has done for you. That if you had to wait till it was all explained, my goodness, you know, uh, well, you just didn't, as it were, have time for that. So, you know, once again, we're growing in grace. And, you know, Isaiah 54, and I like to just take the whole counsel of God, Old Testament and New Testament, and believe me, yeah, there are things that we need to rightly divide between the Old Testament and the New Testament. True. You know, all of the cultic rituals, sacrifices, and whatnot, that doesn't belong to the New Testament. The New Testament has repeated that. 
but over and again the revelation of God, the will of God, and the purpose of God, so that the life of God may be manifested in our life is very common and to both testaments, and it is the majority of what we find there. Okay, so the Lord says by His prophet, uh, by His prophet, um, He says um, that if anybody speaks anything. A contrary to the word, okay? It is because they have no light in them. Now, I gave the wrong reference here, didn't I? I, I think I did. So, you know, what I'm going to do here is just give you a, a, a quick little study if you don't understand how this works. And I'm just going to say, I'm going to put in my search engine, I'm going to put in my search engine word and light, okay? And, and I'm going to let my search engine go over here and do its... Um, work for me, which is a dubious task on if I was just relying upon um, a concordance. And let me see if I can find this real quick quickly. Um, it's Isaiah chapter eight and verse twenty. He says, "To the law and to the testament, to to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word." It is because there is no light in them. And of course, we're not saying if they don't speak according to just what Isaiah was saying at that specific time and in that specific situation, we're also saying that that is God's judgment and that is true no matter where you're at, at what time you are in. It doesn't matter if you're in the first century or the 21st century. It doesn't matter if you're in the you know, 7th century BC or if you're in the 7th century AD or you're in the 21st century AD. It's God's word, and the application of his word is absolutely the same. And so if somebody's declaring the word of God, and other people are saying something differently, then we can respond with the same kind of argument and say, look, if they're saying something different, then what God has said by his anointed prophet, or even more so, what God has written down in his word, then it's because they have no light in them. I mean, of course, the way that Peter said it is absolutely amazing and, and very challenging to all of us. Because he said in Second Peter chapter 1, I was in the holy mount. I heard the audible voice. I, when, when the voice came and said, you know, there at the Mount of Transfiguration is what he's talking about. This is my beloved son. He heard the audible voice of Almighty God. And then he elevates the scripture to a whole other dimension. He elevates the scripture to a place where he says, but... You have a more certain word of prophecy, wherein to you do well if you take heed as into a light shining in a dark place. The word of God is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. So we can understand there the allegorical meaning of they have no light in them. They have no truth in them. Jesus used the same kind of terminology or symbolic or figurative, rather, speech when he said, if your eye is single, then your whole body shall be full of light. Also, John, first John, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, and so these figures of speech can easily be understood as we come up, uh, as we encounter them, simply by the whole or the testimony of the scripture that is given to us elsewhere. So hopefully, as I'm walking you through talking about these various different things in the Bible, I'm always showing you here how to apply hermeneutical rules. Hermeneutical rules is not a harmony. Hermeneutical rules, so you can clearly appreciate the scripture. And um, you know, I'm not going into depth as much as I will when we focus here in a bit. Uh, I think probably I can get through this, and we can start on, at least by lecture four on actually breaking out the doctrines of a fee that are referred to in Acts chapter 8 verses 15 through 16 maybe even back it up even more 14 through 16 so we can understand what is being said and what's not being said we can ask the questions of the scripture um, you know for example I'll just give you a little bit of a hint were the Samaritans saved okay um, they had not received the gift of the Holy Ghost but were they saved um, we're gonna ask that question and we're going to prove to you from the scripture the S&D that they were saved. And we're going to understand why we know that from the scripture. And there's so many other doctrines that are there that we can easily skip over. And that's why it's so important for us to ask questions of the scripture and then look to the word of God to give us answer, not run over to a commentary and expect that the commentary is going to give us um, the answer. Understand what happens is through this process, we watch as men become disciples of men. 
rather than disciples of God and disciples of his word. We want to train you to be disciples of the word of God and not disciples of men. We There is a revelation that God has given him of himself. Then there is a revelation that men have received of the revelation of God. Well, that's suspect. The first is not. The revelation that God has given him of himself is right there contained in the scriptures, the Bible. Praise God. It's preserved. Now, the revelation that men have had of the revelation of God, well, you know what? That's extra biblical. And I don't care who you're going to refer to, whether Origen, Calvin, Luther, it does not matter to me. They don't have a verse of scripture. Augustine, your favorite preacher today, it doesn't matter. None of us have any verses of scripture. We're going to go to the word. We're all going to bow before the word. We're all going to be under the authority and the inspiration of the word. And so real quickly, let me go back and say, well, the people who say that Paul is only, or rather, forgive me, Peter is only referring to the Old Testament, you don't have a basis to say that. Peter lived under the ministry of the, uh, of the only begotten Son of God, Christ Jesus, and understood very clearly that in these last days, God speaking to us or spoke to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Peter understood that. I We can be certain that there was already... Matthew was already laid down. Okay, come on. Mark was already laid down uh, when Peter had given his second epistle. And then, of course, we can also look, and I'll bring this up later too, in First Thessalonians, um, it's chapter two, I believe, it's verse thirteen, where Paul said, "We came to you at Thessalonica, you know, in uh, uh, Macedonia. When we come to you in Thessalonica, you received the word from us, not as the word of men." but as, as it is indeed the word of God. And when people want to say that Paul was speaking and, and not realizing that he was declaring the word of God or that what he, his epistles and his letters are going to be received as something more than just his opinion or what he was persuaded of, that's ridiculous. Paul knew he was speaking by divine revelation. He knew the encounter that he had and the purpose of the encounter and the abundance of revelation of why it was given to him. And thus we have two-thirds of the New Testament written by the hand of, this, of God's servant Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost as he spoke as the oracle of God and knew and cer certainly and indeed that if anybody spoke anything different than what he was saying, as he said to the church of Galatia, let them be accursed. He understood very clearly that he was speaking directly on the behalf of God that was actually absolutely God's will, God's desire, God's purpose. So he said, even if an angel says anything different to you than what you've heard from us or received from us, let them be cursed. Wow. Let that meaning and that value not only be to the church at that time that now is having to appreciate that they are receiving the doctrine of God directly from God through a servant, Paul, but let it be a check and a balance to us today. And let us come to a place of realizing, wait a minute, Paul's curse and what he's declaring that he invoked almost 2,000 years ago is still just as valid today as it was then. Thus, we're going to tremble at the word of God and we're going to take a warning and say, wait a second, I'm not going to involve myself in things that would jeopardize my salvation, that would jeopardize my well-being and my position before the Lord. Are you listening to me? And I don't care what your doctrine is. It has to fall and bow to its knee to the whole counsel of God, not part of the counsel of God. You can't take your favorite verse of scriptures. And I watch this happen all the time. People who are always saying you got to hear the whole counsel of God, yada, yada, yada. They got their favorite verses of scripture that they utilize to trump every other verse of scripture in the Bible. You can't do that. You can't trump every verse of the scripture in the Bible and say, oh, that's obscure. And so now we're going to understand this obscure or hard to understand verse of scripture in view of the things of the verses of scripture that are more clear. The verse of scripture that they're touting isn't any more clear. It's just that they've gone with an idea, a philosophy, a doctrine that they built around that verse of scripture. And when they come to this other supposed more complicated and hard to understand scripture, that in reality is opposing their conclusion, they just make it bow to their ideology, not to the doctrines of the counsel of God. And I'm going to I'm going to be passionate about this because the Lord has stirred me with passion. I'm going to say, let everybody bow their knee to the Word of God. Let God's Word be exalted above everything, 
he himself has exalted his word above his name. Shouldn't we exalt his word? His word has been fully manifested and revealed in the person Christ Jesus, which describes to us his way, his life, the purposes of God, the will of God. It doesn't have to be, you know, discerned through any other method or means. We can behold the Son of God. We can behold the Lamb of God. We can behold the model Son. We can behold the life of God revealed. Father demonstrated to us his will over and again, not hidden it in obscure meanings and definitions of words and, and historical context. Once again, those things are valuable to us. They're meaningful to us, but we are not going to restrain the word of God to those precepts and perceptions of men. We're going to let the word of God speak for himself. For, for, itself on his behalf because that's what he intended you know i see that i'm already running out of time here and i've only got through you know defining the first general rule proving that our rule our hermeneutical rule isn't some man-made philosophical or ideological concept based upon some academic position but that it is def defensible by the word of God itself. And so, you know, you could go to the second one. We, we must approach the word of God with all in humility, humility, trembling at his word. You can look at the verses of scripture that I have there. Some of them you may think are out of context. For example, Exodus 20, 20, but it is not out of context because it is, it is absolutely the condition of how the word of God is presented and why it is presented, even though it is there on Mount Sinai and, you know, Exodus 20, 20, uh, you know, Moses is standing there trying to encourage the people, saying, listen, the Lord has come to prove you, uh, to set his fear or awe before you so that you will not sin. Once again, that's coming to a place of being trembling at his word, being awestruck of who God is, and then, you know, understanding more perfectly who we are in light of who he is and his mercy and his grace, but yet his supreme glory and awesome holiness that he is exalted in. And so it is with the rest of the verses of scripture um, that that are laid out there. Jesus says once again, one, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, he says, come learn of me. But how are you going to learn of me? How am I going to be, how are you going to learn or be taught what I have to say? He's going to say <laughs> to us, once again, he's going to repeat a part of Isaiah um, chapter 66. And he's going to say, I'm lowly and meek. Come take my servitude, my yoke, those things which are the range that which controls me upon yourself. And so next lecture, we're going to try to get through this a little bit quicker. Study the scriptures versus the scripture on your own and uh, watch what God will do as he develops you in his word as we grow and mature because when we receive this as the word of God as it is indeed the word of God and not the word of man what is going to happen to us mm, the word of God is going to work effectually in us to believe and the parables can be understood in literal sense as well. The word of God is like a seed. It comes on the inside of us just as we are born of that incorruptible seed as Peter described. That word of God as a seed comes into us and it develops and it grows and it matures so long as we understand and, and, our guard, and watch out and protect ourselves against it. You know, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the pleasure of this world, the stony ground, the wayside ground, the stony ground, you know, the things that, though the Lord spoke in parables and said, how shall you yet understand all parables? He then lays it out for us to understand even the most, par even the most difficult parable, he gives us the ability to understand. Even the most obscure symbols, he interprets them for us. And I'm going to show you how he does this and, and help you understand that you don't need to be a scholar in Hebrew. You don't need to be a scholar in Greek. All you need to be is a person who's converted, becomes like a child, who's hungry and thirsty, and God will work a miracle and, and come to you and teach you and lead you and guide you into all truth. Every one of you be blessed. We bless you in Jesus' name, and we love you.